want to welcome everyone to Connecticut Main Street Center's March Summit on Addressing Blight and Vacancies on Main Street. My name is Michelle McKee, and I am the Executive Director for Connecticut Main Street Center. For those of you unfamiliar with our organization, we are a coordinating program of Main Street America and a statewide nonprofit that supports communities large and small with revitalization, management, and vibrancy of their village centers, downtowns, neighborhood commercial districts, and main streets. We know that our town centers serve as the face of our cities and our towns. And since taking the helm in 2022, I have seen firsthand the negative impact of even one distressed property or a cluster of vacant storefronts on perceptions, investment, business recruitment, and foot traffic. And I have heard from many of you here today that our municipalities need more tools available to them to address this problem. The purpose of today's summit is twofold. First, to highlight some success stories and current tools and funding that are available to address blight and vacancy. And second, to explore new ideas together that we can implement or advocate to enact. I hope that you will learn a lot ask many questions, connect with peers, practitioners, and experts, and lead inspired. Uh, this summit could not have happened without the hard work and assistance of many people. And I would like to start by thanking Connecticut Main Street's stellar staff, Jennifer Hunter, our events manager, Kristen Lopez, our director of education and training, Christine Schilke, our director of communications and strategy, Carl Rosa, our Director of Field Services, and Judith Stahl, our Business Operations Manager. I don't know if all of our staff have come, but if you can just at least wave so everyone can see you and acknowledge your greatness. Uh, a few words for Liberty, Liberty Bank, who is our presenting sponsor, and they had asked that we share with you that the spirit of this summit embodies that which is important to Liberty and speaks to their mission, which is to quote, improve the lives of our customers, teammates, communities for generations to come. What better way to improve the lives of our customers and teammates than to contribute to the conversation about revitalizing our ministries. And I also want to thank our summit supporting sponsors, the Connecticut Economic Developers Association, LISP, FHI Studio, Fuss and O'Neill, Holman and Comley, Goodwin Hotel, and Ricosi Photography. And to say thank you to board members of Connecticut Main Street Center who are here today, Susan DeSina from DECD, and Mike Andriana, who is doing double duty as a presenter as well. Thank you for being here. And finally, I want to say that we're grateful to welcome the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection and the State Historic Preservation Office as exhibitors. They are outside with lots of information and expertise on the services and funding that they offer to address blight in your community. Many of the tools currently available to us are due to state statute and enabling legislation that's passed by the General Assembly. And we are very fortunate to have two legislators who champion Main Streets up at the Capitol and serve as co-chairs of the Main Street Working Group, Representative Jennifer Lieber of the 132nd District, representing Fairfield and Southport, and Representative Anthony Nolan of the 39th District, representing London. I'm extremely pleased to welcome Representative Lieber here today to offer some welcoming remarks. Hey everyone, it's such a pleasure to be here. It's such a beautiful setting. What an example of um, pristine historical redevelopment that we get to be in today. And thank you, Michelle. And for, you, for those of you who don't know, um, it's really a pleasure to be working and partnering with Michelle in particular because we actually were friends before she took on this job. So it's been um, doubly enjoyable in partnering with the center uh, to support all the work we do on behalf of our communities and supporting our small businesses and bringing vibrancy to our main streets. So I am Jennifer Leeper and I represent Fairfield and I have the distinct pleasure of having two very quaint and charming Main Streets in my district. And when I was first elected in 2020, the wonderful and late Representative Q. Williams uh, offered to let me join him and Representative Jane Garibay in uh, as a tri-chair of the Main Street Working Group. 
compared to their Main Street creds, I brought very little to the table other than a real passion uh, for what this work meant and what it does for our communities. And particularly at that time, through the lens of pandemic isolation and how fostering our Main Streets can create spaces people want to be together. Uh, and I think now, even four years later, we're really seeing even more the impact of uh, isolation and loneliness. And I'm really excited to continue to partner with you guys and how Main Streets can be a part of that solution. I think it's a huge untapped resource and there's a lot of exciting potential there and I'm looking forward to continuing uh, to do that work. But I will just highlight some of the victories we've had together uh, with the center who's just been an incredible champion, as you all know, you're here because you recognize the value in the Main Street Center, but it's been such a pleasure to partner and help bring some legislative victories that hopefully your communities can take advantage of. And a few of those are, um, we've gotten two budget allocations of $350,000 to help fund just the operations of the center. And we will continue to come back to that every, uh, budget session so this year is the short session as I'm sure many of you know and we don't have to fight that battle thankfully this year but we'll be back at it next year uh, we also worked together on the outdoor dining legislation to make it easier for our restaurants to be able to uh, keep their doors open and create spaces outside and not have to go through each of their own local municipal approval processes which we heard was one of the most impactful policies we did for our main streets during the pandemic we also, over the years, have supported the Innovative Corridor Program and the, the Connecticut Communities Challenge Program to try to do some big transformative things for uh, communities that had a vision and needed a big chunk of funding to uh, realize those visions. Last year, we improved the blight and receivership legislation so that if you had a blight on your main street, you had more tools available to receive it and try to put it to more vibrant um, use. And this year, we're working on the land value taxation pilot, which I'm really excited about, and I think has a lot of potential uh, for many communities that are really struggling to get blighted properties uh, up and into uh, vibrant use. So I am grateful to be here, and I won't take up much of your time. You have many more exciting experts to learn from today, and I just want you to know I'm a resource. And Representative Nolan will be stopping by later. It's been such a fun partnership between he and I. And looking forward to continue to uh, support your vision for how we can invest in our Main Street. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Representative Lieber. I can't stress enough how lucky we are to have such an amazing partner in both Rep. Lieber and Rep. Nolan to be able to have these conversations up at the Capitol that are incredibly fruitful. So thank you again. So before we begin our first panel, I just wanted to give a couple of housekeeping pointers. The most important, of course, being that the bathrooms are out here uh, to the <laughs> left. Uh, the second is a brief overview of how we are going to operate today uh, for the event. So, uh, our panels are going to begin with all of our presenters sort of rapid fire, presenting you with information on strategies, funding, and case studies, one after the other. And then we're going to invite the presenters back up to the front where they will be here to field any questions that you have on the material that they presented. And we're looking forward to a very robust conversation and discussion. That is your cue that you are going to be asking lots of questions and we're very excited to hear them. Uh, then we'll take a brief break and then we'll proceed to the second panel that's going to be all about vacancy. First panel is blight, second panel is vacancy. And then after the second break, uh, we're going to move into a works uh, shopping session where you will be divided into groups to discuss new solutions and policies. So this is very much a work, oh, is it hard to hear? Is, it, is this any better in the back? Cool, okay, sorry, I can't see that far away. <laughs> so um, with that, I'm excited to introduce our first set of panelists on the topic of blight. So we will be welcoming Julie Karmelik, the Historic Tax Credit Administrator for the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office, who's going to be providing an overview of SHPO and their financial incentives for historic preservation. Then Jonathan Delgado, the Senior Economic Development Associate with the City of Bridgeport, will be discussing the Post Office Square project. 
Then Peter Ludwig, the Senior Manager of Market Engagement with the Connecticut Green Bank to discuss the CPACE program. Then Rista Malanka, who is the Director of Community and Economic Development with the Northwest Hills Council of Government, will be going through an overview of blighted property receivership and effective municipal blight ordinances. Then welcoming Brian McCann, who is an attorney with Coleman and Conley to discuss blight enforcement in action. Then Mike Andriana, attorney with Coleman and Conley about using the tax increment financing program for blight. And finally, Kevin Grimes, Managing Director of Grow America on acquiring financing for projects. So Julie, if I may welcome you to the podium to kick us off. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, my name is Julie Karbalik. I am one of the Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit Coordinators at the State Historic Preservation Office. And I'm excited to present to you today some of the ways that SHPO's funding can help restore vacant and abandoned buildings. But first, I always like to begin my presentations with a brief description of what the SHPO is and our role within state government. The State Historic Preservation Office, or SHPO for short, oversees the governmental program of historic preservation for Connecticut citizens. Our mission is to strengthen communities by identifying and investing in historic places that define our state's character. The SHPO administers <coughs> many programs, including the National Register of Historic Places, state and federal historic rehabilitation tax credits, and numerous grant and regulatory programs. We're located within the Department of Economic and Community Development, and within DECD, we are part of a cohort that includes the Office of the Arts and the State Museums. So what are the benefits of historic preservation? And why does the state and federal government offer incentives to preserve historic buildings? Studies completed over the past decade, including here in Connecticut, have shown that there are numerous economic and community benefits to historic preservation. Historic preservation rehabilitation projects create jobs, provide safe, affordable, and workforce housing, and put vacant and underutilized properties back on the tax rolls. Many historic buildings are used for small businesses and incubator spaces and, help, and can help reactivate storefronts and revitalize downtowns. Of course, the same can be true and can be achieved with new construction, but what's lost with new construction is the character that defines the state and local community. Also with the loss of a historic property is the loss of its embedded energy. And I'd be remiss if I didn't speak at least briefly about the environmental impacts of historic preservation. Historic preservation is sustainable practice. Preservation maximizes the use of existing materials and infrastructure, reduces waste, and preserves the historic character of older towns and cities. The National Trust for Historic Preservation's 2011 The Greenest Building Study found that when comparing buildings of equivalent size and function, building reuse almost always offers environmental saving over demolition and new construction. The Greenest Building Study is further supported by Architecture 2030's CARE Tool. The CARE Tool was designed by a nonprofit group of architects dedicated to creating zero emission buildings by 2030. And I encourage everybody to take a look at it. The website's right up here. It's a really, really interesting tool, and I think one that, that we should all be looking at in the future. So, with that background, let's talk about the SHPO's programs that can help incentivize um, the rehabilitation of vacant and underutilized buildings. The SHPO offers several programs that I wanted to bring to everyone's attention, including state and federal historic tax credits and grant programs. The first up is the Historic Homes Rehabilitation Tax Credit, and this program offers um, a tax credit to private homeowners of historic properties of one to four units. The building must be owner-occupied and serve as the owner's primary residence. The credit itself is equal to 30% of eligible expenditures, which for this program include all the hard costs associated with the rehabilitation, up to $30,000 per dwelling unit. The, applicant, the applicant's project must contain a minimum expenditure of $15,000, and the properties must be listed on either the state or national register of historic places. 
<coughs> if you're unsure if your property is listed on the State or National Register, I um, do want to take a moment to give a shout out to the SHPO's new GIS mapping system, which was created last year. It's called Concris. Um, the website is at the bottom of the screen. And if you'd like to know if your property is listed on the State or National Register, or if you'd like to incorporate historic maps into your planning documents, I encourage you to check it out. The next program is the Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program, which is the one that I administer. And that is a, a tax credit um, equal to 25% for the rehabilitation of historic properties. That historic properties that follow the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. There is an additional 5% for properties that include an affordable housing component or are located in a federally designated opportunity zone. I will point out that this is not a maintenance and repair program. It is for the purpose of putting vacant or unutilized buildings back in service and there is a certificate of occupancy requirement at the end of the project. The program itself has a $4.5 million per project cap and a $31.7 million cap annually with which I can make tax credit reservations on given projects. The credit itself is intended to be sold to a C corporation that would offset the credits to, uh, on their state income tax. And as a result, nonprofit organizations and municipalities, as well as private developers, are eligible for this program. The next program is the Federal Historic Tax Credit Program, which is run by the National Park Service and the, and the um, IRS. The SHPO serves as, as the liaison between the applicants and the National Park Service, and all inquiries to the programs of, of the programs come to the SHPO first. The Federal Historic Tax Credit Program offers a 20% credit on eligible expenditures, and in order to qualify for the program, the property must be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, like the state rehab tax credit, it must meet the standards for rehabilitation and the properties must be income producing post rehab. All of these tax credit programs have a multi-part application process. So this is not an emergency repair type. These are not emergency repair programs. So um, please allow for review times and application submission for application submissions. Finally, I just want to talk briefly about our grant programs. These are available for nonprofits and municipalities. They can fund anything from state and national register nominations to plans and specs for capital improvements, feasibility studies, and planning documents. Most of our grants are matching and reimbursable, and each program has its own funding levels, but they typically range between $5,000 to $200,000 for the largest um, historic restoration fund grant. I, I'm not a grant administrator, so I'm going to encourage you to contact uh, the administrator <laughs> that's just located on our website, um, and I can give you that information at the end of the presentation or at the end of the day if you'd like it. So, but in closing, um, early communication with the SHPO is key. If you're working with a potential applicant or you're considering <coughs> applying to one of our programs, please reach out to the SHPO as early as possible to ease the application process. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? In the back? Okay. Um, it actually feels a bit awkward to go after Julie because we're going to talk about demolishing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> an assembly of five parcels, but the project that it's next to, I'm sure Julie's familiar with, now is J.C. Newfield, a mixed-use um, residential development property across the street. So there was multiple attempts to make preservation block work, um, and ultimately it came to a place where the city ended up uh, conveying it back, uh, it was conveyed back to the city, and ultimately in order to try to support the project that was happening across the street with SHPO, um, there was a push to demolish the government. So what we have now is what we call Post Office Square. It's namesake in part because the post office is across the street. Um, 
and there was a desire to try to make this an activated space. In fact, when I was hired about two years ago, that was one of the things that was on that first you know, five things on the to-do list. Is, uh, to focus on how we can make this space active and create what Bill Coleman, my boss, has described as an outdoor living room. So I think location is really important with this. Not only is it next to a new development we wanted to support, but we have the bus terminal about two blocks away, the train station is about three blocks away. Um, as you can see, it ends up being kind of a trio with outdoor spaces. The one thing that I'll say is, uh, and those that work in economic development, we have to be careful with things being uh, understood as parks. So we want to make sure that this is seen as a space that we want to activate, but but not something that can end up being taken over there. So in that, in my travels, I looked at a lot of um, container uh, container parks or, or other ways of doing activations on a temporary basis in San Diego. I was out there in 2017, and I saw what they called the courtyard. That was actually a, a number of grad students who was there on a capstone project, a bunch of architecture uh, students, and they were focused on trying to take vacant land that the city of San Diego had and find a way to activate it to try to induce development. Um, ultimately, the, the original property, which isn't the one that's pictured on the bottom right hand corner, um, ended up you know, functioning so well that they moved to what is now the location that's pictured. And then um, my brother ended up moving to Tampa, I saw Spartan's Wharf, which really has a unique space there. It's going on the waterfront. They have uh, food, but also uh, a large beer garden and other spaces <coughs> to get out. And then what you see on the bottom left hand corner was Altoona, which I don't think they've done yet. Um, that's in Wisconsin. I ended up speaking with the town manager there, and they were looking at similar concepts. So it really gave me an idea of how this can function. And I think the backdrop in all this was we were also working with the Downtown Special Services District, which is a community mission member, in trying to soften the edges of the downtown. So that culminated in about 33 different art projects, ranging from street murals, um, obviously traditional murals, but then some you know, innovative seating concepts and things like that, all informing kind of where we were, the direction that we were heading in. So in this, Takina Pollock Shaver, a uh, Bridgeport resident, was really interested in trying to uh, bring roller skating back. All of the rinks have since closed. I think Strafford used to be one of the closest to me growing up. Um, and so they, they had done this already on uh, at different streets, but I felt like here we have energy here. We're trying to figure out what this space is going to be. So why don't you come between these two blocks? Let's uh, you know shut off uh, main and middle and focus on what this could look like here. And so in 2022, there was a lot of activation and um, that led to a desire to make that kind of like a permanent home for where this was going to be. So there was a design for a street mural that they thought would be fun for people to skate around uh, in design with, with Roswell Branch, who's another Bridgeport resident and uh, business owner, and uh, figure out how we can get to a place where she can end up renting skates. So that ultimately led to an access agreement and a uh, container that was used to uh, rent skates in June of last year. It also led to a conversation with Berlinetta Brewing, which is across the street. And they had a desire to expand. They're only about 2,000 square feet. And they didn't have much in the way of outdoor space. So they did some you know, uh, benches in that outside the building on kind of like a outdoor patio set up. But they wanted to, they constantly looking at the space and said, how can we do something over there? They want to do bocce courts. Bocce is not something that you often see, so I was all, all for it. Uh, and ultimately, that culminated in the lease about 5,000 square feet across from um, across from where they're at, and that's been operating for about a year now, looking for them to, to open again. There was also food trucks. That was kind of a, a pilot that we tried, and a lot of those conversations culminated in this very early concept that created an iPad. So it's not 
what it will look like, but it was enough to get the state's attention in order to get a grant to then try to make it a reality. Um, and a lot of those partners that were listed already, and then others that have shown interest in trying to uh, continue to activate that space, and that led us to the Community Challenge Grant with the ECP. So I think one of the things, once you're finding these ideas and then it's figuring out a funding source that can make it happen, right, to add some capital, but I needed to go further than that, and this seemed like a really great fit, and uh, the state seemed to think so as well. That 4.2 was wrong, so I realized that in my notes, but the idea here is, you know, especially when it comes to state grants, they tend to uh, recognize pre-expended funds. So that was why it was really optimal for us to partner with the ECD in order to uh, come up with a, a capital structure that makes sense. So I think that's my tip, my time. But, so. Sound good? Okay. Uh, so I'm Peter with the Connecticut Green Bank. I'll just touch, basically I'm going to touch briefly on who we are and what we do, and I'll talk really briefly about one of our programs, um, our CPACE program. But so we're a quasi public state agency. We've been around for about 10 years, um, created by statute, but also using essentially um, the, I would say like, private sector tools to get projects done, so we do a lot of financing. Um, our job usually is to be sort of trying to enable transactions, to administer new programs in the clean energy space, um, and um, what we're really what we're really sort of all about is helping Connecticut in terms of our economic development, but also helping the state for decarbonization goals, um, make sure that those benefits reach you know, all of our families and communities and building others. We're really trying to confront climate change with people at the center, but using private disciplines to do so. Um, so, um, okay, I just put this up. I'm talking about commercial buildings basically today. But we do a lot of other things. So, if you have questions about energy programs, even if it's not the Green Bank program, I'm happy to help be a resource and guide you in the right direction. Um, I wanted to also say that the Green Bank started as an energy, uh, essentially an energy program, uh, but recently uh, we were expanded to uh, we were really looking at environmental infrastructure, and that could mean oops, that could mean anything from you know helping a, a, a municipality figure out like a, a wastewater um, issue. It could mean uh, land conservation or agriculture. So we have a great kind of small but growing new team who's focused on those issues. Um, so in my talk, I'm going to be talking about, hey, you're building a building on a, maybe a, a, a parcel of land that's uh, in a blighted area, but uh, you know, you might, as a municipal economic development person, or you may not decide that building is the right thing, and we're also happy to have that conversation with you if there's a way that we can support um, some another alternative solution um, that has other environmental and economic <coughs> development benefits. So, um, okay. So I want to talk about CPACE. Does any who's heard of CPACE, the program? Awesome. It's been around for about 10 years. We've done almost, I think we're the next project that we close will be the 400th project. Um, so it's pretty exciting. Um, the way it works is municipalities opt in, <coughs> almost everyone has, and then we can come in, basically put uh, a benefit assessment on the property, which stays with the property when the property changes hands. It allows us to make long-term loans up to 25-year terms, um, and in most cases we can cover 100% of the upfront costs, um, and uh, it's an exciting program. We were recently allowed to include electric vehicle charging uh, infrastructure, so EV charging, and also uh, climate resilience measures is a new uh, element that we're rolling out, so we're very excited about that. And this program has been available for building retrofits for some time, and I'm like, we've probably worked with a lot of you in the room, um, and then a couple of years ago, we started piloting the program for new construction. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that because most of the time, you know, an area that, like a building that's blighted, it's been vacant, you know, you're not going to come to us, a developer or an owner is not going to come to us and say, hey, I want a $300,000 loan to do solar or HVAC system. They're going to say, hey, we 
we're doing, you know, thirty million dollar rehab of this building. So that's kind of the way this program is structured. So just conceptually, um, what we what we have here is just like a really simple capital stack um, where you've got a you know a senior loan and some other kinds of debt and equity. Um, and what we're saying is that CPACE um, is going to be probably cheaper than some of those other kinds of debt and equity. So it should be complementary to your, your senior lender. So a developer could come to us, sort of reduce their average cost of capital. But, I mean, that's in, in most simple terms, that's that's how it works. Um, and then of course on the right, we're just saying, hey, since CPACE is cheaper, maybe you could just you have more capital available. So that is theoretically how it works. Um, I just I just included some more details. I thought the slides might be shared, but I'm not going to like talk through all the details. But essentially, the way the program works is developers come to us hopefully early on, and they say, "Hey, we really want to make this building super efficient." We say, "Great, let's talk to." Like first of all, we, we want you to talk to EverSource or UI because they have great programs for new construction. They'll provide free money. They'll also they also might say, "Hey, you should do a building model. You should hire this energy modeler." And, or they might just say, here, here, here's a target you should hit for the efficiency of the new building. If they say, go get an energy model, we look at that model and we say, great, you're building a building that's more efficient than code. That's how you qualify for the CPACE new construction program. So you can get between 20 and 35% of your eligible construction costs, depending on how efficient the building is going to be. That's pretty much it. Um, and we'll help you sort it out. I put this in just case you're sharing the slides and then we'll talk about that. We're also encouraging people to do some of these um, <coughs> measures that will help us really move to a kind of smarter, more efficient uh, electric grid. So batteries, um, EV charger, solar, um, both us and the utilities are trying to do a lot more heat pumps so you can get some bonus points, so to speak. We can talk about it in more detail. Um, I want to also say that you know CPACE works for everything from you know, I'm working with a church that wants to do like, they want like $50,000 to do some installation and some lighting. Um, but there was also, in terms of the kind of rehabilitation or, or renewal of properties, you know, in West Hartford, we did um, it was the, um, St. Joseph Convent, where it was almost a $14 million in this loan um, to add some, to refurbish one building add some housing um, and create a kind of mixed use property. So it really can serve a wide range of types of buildings and we want to help you figure it out. Good morning. Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Public Act 1992, which is the uh, receivership, like the receivership statutes, and 23-33 uh, ordinance on um, blight uh, tools. So a little bit of a background. In 2019, I was the Economic Development Director for the City of Torrington, and we had a property right in downtown that had been vacant for years, taking up a whole city block. and completely, you know, all of the negative things that I'm sure we all have seen in our communities. We had had fire marshal issue orders, we had had our building official issue orders, we had even worked with um, our state prosecutor and pressed criminal charges and the owners were arrested and we were not seeing any compliance or any movement towards compliance on this property. So we were struggling with what to do and in 2020, Public Act 1992 was approved. Now, circled the effective dates because these are very relatively new statutes. So there's not a lot of case law, there's not a lot of examples of these. In the end of 2023, we had filed a lawsuit or a petition with the courts for receivership. At the time, we were the second case to be brought as receivership. The first case was in Harford, it was uncontested, it kind of went right through. Ours was contested. Um, in the end of 2023, the judge finally made a decision. We still don't have receivership. It's still going through the process. So it's a very long uh, process and lots of resources, which I think um, 
Public Act 2333 is helped to give us some more tools. So I'm going to go very quickly through these, very high level, but uh, they are new. So Public Act 1992 basically said uh, a municipality with a population of 35,000 or more, a, a party interested in filing a petition can do that. Crossed out 35,000 or more because that did change in a Public Act 23-33 to 15,000 people. Um, we'll get into that later. But I wanted to point out a party of an interest is the only one who could file a petition. So who is a party of interest? an owner of the building, a lien holder, um, a resident or a business in the municipality provided that residence or business is a thousand feet from the building, a development organization, but the development organization has to be in the municipality that the building is located and have participated in a project within five miles of the building or the municipality can do that. So once um, you're a party in interest and you can file a petition, the court then may appoint receivership, but there are some statute, there are some requirements that you have to prove. Um, so the building um, has to um, be vacant for at least 12 months. Um, it cannot be actively marketed for sale. There has to be no pending foreclosure, and the property owner has not acquired the building in the last 12 months. Those conditions apply, and at least three of these conditions apply. So these are the conditions that really pose that uh, negative impact to the greater good or to the community. So, you know, it's a nuisance, uh, substantial rehabilitation is needed, uh, risk of fire, susceptible to entry, um, you know, nuisance for children, you think of those wells um, in basements, um, illicit purposes, prostitution, drug, vacancy, uh, presence of vermin, um, and it's negatively impacting the economic well-being of residents in the close proximity. If you have all those conditions and at least three of these, um, the, the courts may appoint receivership. And in uh, the case that I was working on, every single one of these applied. And it still took three years. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so if you are lucky enough to get receivership, the statutes, there's a lot of things that you can do, and I'm not going to go through all that. You'll look at the statute, but there's a few things that you must do. I just wanted to point these out because if you do get receivership, you need to make sure you have the resources to do these things. Um, maintain and safeguard and insure the property. You need to make sure that all the revenues you're collecting, if the building is um, collecting revenues at, at some point, uh, that they're consistent with the statute, um, that you develop a receivership plan, and in the statute there's a lot of detail as to what that receivership plan has to include, a uh, time frame that you have to submit it to the court, it has to be approved by the court. Um, it does talk about historic preservation and the different things that you have to do. You need to implement the plan, and you need to report back to the court at least annually. Um, and then, like I said, there's a lot of other things that you can do, but this does take resources, this does take time. Um, so, you know, going to Public Act 2333, I think that this really just gives you some more tools in your tool belt that might be a little bit easier uh, to implement, um, but, you know, light is not easy. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I just want to put this summary up there, uh, the OLR bill analysis, there's a link for you. Um, and I'm only going to touch on a few of these. So I did mention that it reduced the threshold from, from 35,000 to 15,000 people for communities who can <coughs> utilize the receivership statute. This was highly uh, contested, there's a lot of controversy around it. Because it's not a requirement, it's an option, some people thought it should be zero. Um, but, but nonetheless, it was settled on 15,000. In Torrington, we have just over 35,000 people. Depending on the data you looked at, some of us said we had just under 35,000 people. So this went to court and you know, the, um, the owner of the building saying they're not eligible. They can't use the statute. The judges decided that the census data was the data that they were using and with the census data we had over 35,000. So just, Keep in mind, you know, which resource you're, you're using when you determine 
if you're eligible or not. Um, and the other one I wanted to touch on here was that it increased the penalties um, from $100 a day to $1,000 for repeat offenders. And what does repeat offender mean? So in the statute, there's two different sections that talk about the third or more such blight. And if there are third or more blight violations, municipalities can take immediate action and they can increase fines to $1,000 a day. So a repeat offender, if you look at the picture on the bottom, that's pretty easy. You have you know tall grass, they come and mow it. A month later, you go back, the grass is tall again. You gotta issue new orders, they cut the grass, come back, that's, that's easy. But the one on the top, that never gets into compliance. Okay? And if it was remediated, that road's not gonna cave in again right away within 12 months. So there was some conversation around this as to what could that mean and what is this really truly trying to do? So if the condition uh, was resolved and comes back, that's a, an offense and you know three times and these conditions apply. Every 120 days, the violation is not uh, remediated, that counts as one violation. That's keeping within the sphere of that 12 month period. So if there's a violation that's there for a year uh, that has not been remediated, you can you know take immediate action and issue more fines. And if you have those properties that just have more conditions, um, three conditions. So peeling paint, caving in roof, and boarded windows, you can right away start those immediate action or higher fines. Uh, you don't have to wait uh, that year. And that's all I have. <laughs> so <laughs> try to talk as quick as possible. <laughs> must be issued, there must be a reasonable opportunity to correct or remediate, uh, and then uh, a municipality may take immediate enforcement action uh, after uh, the third blight uh, enforcement action, the third blight citation. Um, the ordinance itself must establish a duty to maintain the property prescribing 
specific elements that would constitute uh, uh, blight, and then you're allowed to prescribe a, a, a penalty. Um, you can see the penalties, uh, they, they vary. And then finally, you need to uh, uh, have a due process for the property owners that are cited in the form of a citation uh, hearing procedure. Um, this is, uh, actually it was just spoken about, this is the PA 2333. And I, I include this only to uh, sort of highlight where we are sort of headed. And you know, I was happy to read online when I was looking up some of these that the Connecticut Main Street Center was involved with PA 2333. Uh, uh, Jennifer, uh, Representative Jennifer Lieber was instrumental in that. And I, I, I think it's great. I mean, I, I know that if we had this uh, 20 years ago, it would have it would have really made a difference. Uh, but essentially, what it does is it reduces the, the population uh, threshold for the receivership. It adds on uh, commercial properties to the existing uh, 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 statute, which allows for remediation of housing blight. It increases the permissible fines. We just talked about those. And um, it reduces the notice requirements to, to leaners of a, of a property. I just detailed just like a real, real quick and dirty sort of process. Um, the first step is you draft an adoptive light ordinance, get your town attorney involved for those people that aren't involved with the municipalities. Petition your town to have this to this process because I, th I think you know as you'll learn today it's, it really is beneficial. Uh, appoint a blight officer. It could be an existing position. It could be a new position. In our uh, in Norwalk, it was the building official at, at the time, 20 years ago. But they've actually expanded into an entire blight office with multiple personnel. Um, citation hearing officer. Uh, a very uh, unlucky, uh, perhaps local town attorney <laughs> that wants to donate some time. Um, we we had a fantastic one, and he made he made all the difference. Um, the inspection photographs and inspection report be detailed, document exactly what you believe is the is the uh, blight, um, what should be done to remediate the blight. Uh, warning notice. Um, this is when it does get a little bit technical. Um, there is a requirement for notice to the lien holders. That sometimes could be difficult. Just a quick practice tip. Um, when we did it in Norwalk, we actually had specific contracts, like volume contracts with title uh, searchers. We had a contract with a title searcher, and we also had a contract with a uh, State Marshal, because we wanted to make sure that we did it once and we did it right. So we found out exactly who the universe of lien holders are up front, served, uh, <coughs> provided them the legally required notice, and then when it came time to actually serve the notices, we had a Marshal's return. So there was never a situation where, rarely a situation where someone would finally come forward either show up before the hearing officer, show up in court and say, oh, I never I never saw that. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, rarely, rarely happened, but I hear that a lot in other municipalities. Um, the citation, uh, it has to contain the notice of an appeal right. Uh, the blight hearing, uh, that's where the citation hearing officer will hear the evidence. It doesn't have to be extremely formal. I've always uh, counseled my clients to just basically apply fundamental fairness, the rule of fundamental fairness. For all your land use gurus, you know exactly what that is. It's not an exact science, but make sure that they have the right to uh, present whatever evidence, whatever extenuating circumstances, consider those things. Maybe the person, maybe the property owner is 90 years old. Maybe they're uh, uh, wheelchair bound. Um, you should take those things into account. Um, the notice of assessment, 
that's what the hearing officer finds and, and so orders. And then the blight lien, which will go on the property, go on the land records, will be sent over to the tax collector, and it actually serves exactly as a tax lien. And it's enforced as a tax lien as well, which is really important because that has priority. And um, for all you uh, municipalities that have tax sales or uh, tax lien sales, they're very effective. Um, when somebody is going to sell your property, you tend to wake up and do something about the problem. Um, just really quickly, uh, my keys to um, successful enforcement are, uh, it requires an investment. Um, and what I mean by that is, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to hide that uh, or delude anyone. It's, it requires a, an upfront investment. It probably is going to require legal services. It's definitely going to require staff services. Um, you need to just sort of get over that, um, because in my experience, the the results are, are well worth the investment for the community. Um, and then secondly, I've found in doing this for 20 years or so, um, there, there's no one size fits all approach. So, uh, you know, sometimes what I mean by that is sometimes it's just being creative. Sometimes you actually do get action from the lien holders. There's been plenty of times where I've actually, depending upon the bank, some are helpful, some are very not helpful. Um, they do have officers there that manage uh, these things and they sometimes will inspire uh, the property owner or actually hire a contractor themselves to do the work. Other times, I mean, I, I can tell you a hundred stories. I've had people uh, entered into conservatorships. Um, you just, you have to think outside the box and you have to not be linear in your, in your approach to any one enforcement action. Um, and then lastly, I just included a couple slides, um, just a couple small examples of where, you know, we have a before and after. Um, I was taking a look at this just now, and I was thinking that the historical people here probably are looking at those columns. Is that right? <laughs> really, really hated the after as compared to the before, but I apologize. And then I just included down, down here, the fine on this particular property was ninety-six hundred dollars. The demo permit brought in a hundred, brought in a thousand dollars for the town. The building permit brought in sixteen thousand dollars for the town. And then this is the big one, um, but it's not all inclusive because all you economic people know it goes well beyond the twenty thousand dollars additional per year in taxes that this that this brought in. It's it revitalizes the neighborhood. It it brings uh, 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 new residents to the neighborhood and does wonders for the town. So thank you so much for your. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Andriana, partner at uh, Pullman and Conley. Uh, most of my practice focuses on public or government finance. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this short and sweet. Uh, most of you here, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces, have kind of heard my TIFF talk before, so uh, we'll go over that very quickly. Um, just the bottom line. Um, you know, for upgrading or rehabilitating blighted property, you're going to need money. And, and the key is, where are you going to get this money from? And if you have a motivated property owner, whether that's the original property owner or a new property owner, or it might even be the town, you know, fixing a blighted building is going to cost something. So what you can go to the next page, uh, What tax increment financing does is, is it provides a source of revenue that the town can come up with to help finance 
the upgrades to a uh, blighted building. Basically, the way tax increment financing works is that it's based on increases in assessed value that generate extra taxes, and the tax increment financing legislation, which has now been around for about 10 years, allows the town to kind of separate those new taxes from the kind of the regular general fund deposit of taxes and put it in kind of a segregated account to be used for properties that sit within a TIF district. And a TIF district can be one parcel if you have a special development project or maybe one big blighted building, or it could be a whole downtown with over a, a hundred parcels. And, and you'll see examples in Connecticut of both of those. Um, under this new legislation right now, there's probably, I'd say, 10 to 15 TIF districts within the state of Connecticut uh, that kind of use this program. The next one. This is just a visual uh, of how TIF works. Uh, bottom left, the fixed tax base. Whatever the tax base, whatever taxes you were collecting on the blighted building, which probably is not going to be a lot, uh, the town gets to keep that. Once upgrades are made, uh, it increases the taxes. That increment is what can be used by a municipality to help pay for upgrades and all kind of TIF programs, TIF districts have like a definite life. Under the statute, it can be up to 50 years. Most don't go that long. But once the TIF district terminates, then all of the tax revenue from the built properties within the TIF district go back to the town kind of in their regular general fund collection. Um, OK, uh, this is probably the most important <laughs> slide for most of us here today. Like, so specifically, how can you use TIF, TIF revenues? And they're to upgrade uh, lighted buildings. And there's two kind of primary examples, and both of these are used in Connecticut. One, like the top one there, would be very typical if a municipality decided to make their whole downtown a TIF district. So there's lots of buildings in there. Obviously, not all of them are blighted. The town. As assessments of those buildings increase and as taxes go up, the municipality is collecting money, they segregate that money, and now they can use that money for a variety of expenses, costs, programs within the TIF district. And some of the examples, and these are real life examples, are make a revolving loan fund. And you can use that to loan money to a property owner and then they pay you back and you can use it again. Code compliance, uh, upgrades that are needed, particularly with blighted buildings, and even rental payment assistance. So if you have an upgraded building and a tenant comes in and really can't afford uh, the rent, uh, you could use TIF monies to help, pay, help the landlord collect some rent. On the bottom here, you can also use TIF if you have a specific property uh, and the property owner is willing to pay some of the upfront costs to uh, improve that property, you can use these TIF revenues to basically repay the uh, property owner for the money it put in. Okay, real quick, there's some steps to adopting a TIF district and I won't go through this. Uh, but basically, if you have a motivated municipality and uh, property owners, you can get this done in three months. I would say typically the time is six months. Um, next slide. These are just some of the components of when you're establishing a district, what goes into the master plan. I can talk about this later with anyone that's interested. And then I think that's it. The only thing I would say, and I just want to make sure this is clear, is that you can use like a TIF program with Julie's historic district money. You can kind of pair the two and, and create even more revenues for a project that helps. So, thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I first want to say thank you for Michelle for inviting me uh, to speak uh, to you this morning. Uh, also, I want to big shout out to Jennifer. I, I was late in getting my slides, and I got to her at nine o'clock last night. And she was able to load it up uh, for this. So thank you. For so uh, Kevin Grimms from uh, Brewer America. Um, some of you might know uh, 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 the organization as National Development Council. Uh, National Development Council was founded 50 some odd years ago. Uh, NDC has also been, we've been referred to. But we went through a rebranding exercise in the last year and now we're now doing business as, as Grow America. So whether it be NDC or Grow America, we're a national nonprofit that works on behalf of municipalities to help attract funding. Uh, to uh, structure, prioritize real estate transactions, and then to uh, right-size the public incentive package to meet the needs of the project and, and, and the, our local municipal clients. Okay. So I, I noticed in the, by sitting in the back, this chic, uh, um, <laughs> it's a nice, it, it, it's a, it, it's a nice uh, light fixture, but it does um, obstruct uh, a little bit of view. So. What, what I wanted to talk to you about today is just general approaches. And we've heard from a lot of great speakers that have talked on some of the programs that I'm gonna to touch upon. So I'm obviously not gonna get into detail onto those programs, but really I, I, I wanted to just go through the general approach of putting together financial structures for blighted and vacant properties. Uh, fact of the matter is that if they're vacant or blighted, it's usually for an economic reason that the numbers don't pencil out. And in many of these cases, when you look at the redevelopment of these uh, properties, you see that the development cost is gonna be a lot more than what it's gonna be worth after you finish it. So if you have development costs that exceeds value, it results in a funding gap. Uh, and there's really not one approach to fill the funding gap. The easy approach is to say, yeah, we need a grant from the state to fill that funding gap. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that it, it really in, involves a whole array of approaches to, uh, to meet and, and to close the funding gap. Um, I think the good news, and well, first of all, this is a magnificent site to have this conference. Um, this was a property that was uh, vacant for over 10 years. It's obviously right to the downtown, so it was really important to encourage the reinvestment into this property, I think. It went dark in 2008, and it was reopened again in 2018. And this property is reflective of the type of creative approach that is needed in utilizing a broad range of resources. Certainly the federal and state historic tax credits were instrumental in, in a redevelopment of a property like this. Uh, the, uh, the other good news is that, is that you know, I think back to Connecticut communities 10, 15 years ago, there was a heck of a lot more vacant and blighted properties than there, um, than there are now. Uh, and there are fewer blighted and vacant properties due to, the, due to the tools that have been established at both the federal and the state level. And I've been working in economic development finance for Connecticut for over two decades, three decades actually. And uh, I, I think right now you have the best range of resources in the toolkit to assemble uh, funding structures for vacant and, and blighted properties. So for Department of Housing, Department of Economic and Community Development, the SHPO office, uh, they, they all deserve a lot of credit for putting together programs that are responsive to the marketplace. So uh, what, what this slide says, for most of you can't see it, is, is incentives and approaches. I'm just gonna go through the incentives and approaches. Number one is reduce the development costs. You have to find a way to reduce your development costs to, as a means of lowering the gap. Number two is reduce the cost of capital. When you reduce the cost of capital, you expand borrowing costs. Number three is reduce operating costs. Operating costs is either a partial tax abatement or tax increment financing. And then also, we've heard about uh, various credits. Um, so you use uh, housing credits as a means of attracting private investment. And the three tax credits that are often used are housing tax credits, uh, historic credits, and new market tax credits. And all three of them could be used for attracting private investment in exchange for dollar for dollar investments. Okay. 
So reduce the development costs. The easiest way to reduce the development costs, if you have a property that is owned by a municipality for a developer, uh, the municipalities want fair market value. But if they want the, re want the property redeveloped, oftentimes you'll need to, uh, for the developers to acquire that at a, re at, at, at a, uh, bargain, a bargain price or contribute the, the property to, uh, to the development. Uh, the, the other approach is, is to waive the uh, building and permit fees. And then the most important thing, I think, is ha having a partnership where the, the developers know that the approval process in terms of permitting could be expedited because time is money. Okay. Second is reduce the cost of capital. We have a whole range of... Pro uh, you you want to look at maximizing debt. And when you maximize debt, you look to subordinated funding sources. The best example right now in Connecticut is CHFA created a new program, for Build for Connecticut. A wonderful program in which they're providing financing that has amortization periods up to 40 years and a lower interest rate as, 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 as low as 2%. So an example there just stretches that borrowing capacity. Okay. Um, the other one is reduced operating costs through partial tax abatements or um, it was mentioned, um, Peter went through the, uh, the, um, um, the, uh, the CPACE program, where you have the green design results in lower energy costs and that assessment allows you to borrow a subordinated credit facility through the, the CPACE loan. Um, and then um, Mike just touched upon the tax increment financing program with the TIF program. Best example of this, uh, we work with the town of Windsor to put together a, um, a, partial, a partial tax abatement uh, over a 10 year period of time to incentivize a 29 million mixed use, mixed income, uh, transit oriented development uh, right next to the train station in downtown Windsor. It's gonna be a really transformative project for, the, for, for that town. And one more slide. And, um, and then the last is using tax credits to, uh, to attract equity. Again, you have three types of credits. You have 9% and 4% housing tax credits for developments involving affordable housing, historic credits, and new market tax credits. Now I'm just gonna <laughs> go through three, th three quick examples. This is Paniba Mills in, in Norwich. Uh, $100 million three-phase development. We use both housing credits and uh, historic credits for the redevelopment of that. It's interesting, there's a mixed income, so uh, it was about half of the units were market, half were, were affordable, but we were able to capture equity off of the housing credits based upon the 50% of affordable. Uh, this is a development that used both historic credits and new market tax credits, Old Town Hall. We did that a while ago, but it would have been vacant for about 20 years, and it needed a combination of two credits to allow for the raising of $8 million as part of that $16 million development. Um, and uh, that's it. Great, thank you. With uh, questions, raise your hand. Ah, Kevin, Kevin Buehmeyer. I'll start us off with an easy one. Okay, this is for Julie. Julie, uh, you brought up obviously state and federal um, preservation uh, grants and tax credits. Uh, my simple question is, can you uh, have both at the same time? Yes, they can be layered. You can do both the state and federal at the same time. Hi, good morning. Kevin Brown from Norwich. Uh, this is for Winston about the interested parties clause. I don't know that I have personally figured out the power or position of NRZs in our state, but can an NRZ be an interested party? Because I didn't see them explicitly listed. 
Uh, here, let's pass the. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's. Um, it was established as a development organization, you know, and it met that criteria, possibly. Um, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure how that would work. Uh, we have another lawyer that wants to Yeah, I mean, my gut is probably, yeah. Probably, right? if, yeah, if there are anything like the, the, the Hartford Inter yeah, you know, formally you organized. Because you look at the black and white list and you're not on it, it's an agency of a municipality, perhaps? Well, and I can tell you, um, in Tarleton, we have a development corporation, but it didn't meet that criteria. We essentially petitioned that they be the receivership, but the town, the municipality, uh, filed the petition. So once we file the petition, that doesn't necessarily mean that's who the receiver is going to be. Deanna Road, City of Norwich also. Um, question for Rissa um, about the taxes during receivership. Who's paying those on the property? Uh, <clears throat> nobody. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the town doesn't, is not going to pay themselves. But they were being, they were being, well, I should have said nobody. The property owner is responsible to pay them. If the property owner wasn't paying them before, um, then they're not going to pay them. Um, but if they were paying them, they should continue to pay them. for Brian. Brian, when we were talking about your talk that you were going to give today, there was one thing that really struck me, and that was, I forgot the legal term for it, the fair use or, I don't know, anyways, but you were <laughs> talking about kind of a holistic approach that the blight enforcement team took with the hearing officer and kind of taking kind of a compassionate approach and kind of the returns that you saw on that approach versus a very transactional you know, citation, citation. Can you just speak a little bit to that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, when the law first came out, I remember that there was actually a, a requirement. I'm not sure if it's still in there, but there was a requirement that they actually include resources for the property owner in the actual citation. Uh, resources could vary, um, but, you know, uh, community groups that could that could help out, perhaps some financial assistance uh, if the if the property owners you know on fixed income. Um, but yeah, I I think the most gratifying part about my last job, my last position, was really just uh, you know reaching out attempting to work with that property owner. You're, you're going to have two situations. You're going to have somebody who ducks, the, I, I called it the ostrich approach, they're going to duck their head in the sand and pretend there's no problem, um, or, or they're going to show up to the hearing and present some sort of extenuating circumstances. The best thing in my experience is that you get the person to the hearing officer, and I actually implemented a policy in my old position where we gave a hearing to everyone, regardless of whether the, the, the statute says you have to request it, the ordinance says you have to request it, but I uh, instituted a policy where we just gave a hearing to everyone. This is gonna be the day, if you show up, you'll have a hearing. If not, we'll enter a judgment against you, uh, but it's gonna be your opportunity. And the reason why I did that is because I think it's best if you start the conversation. If you hear from them, if you understand what their issue is, if you try to find resources, if you try to help them out. Like I said, you know, one time it was a woman who our health officials went into the, the, the house and the entire bathtub was filled up with human excrement. You know, obviously that person's not doing well and, 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 and blight is probably the least of their, their issues. So, you know, what, what I, tried to do is assist that person. That was actually the one that I said we, we got into a, a voluntary conservatorship. We got the probate court involved. Um, but yeah, I, I always uh, encouraged with 
my staff a holistic approach involving the property owner as much as you possibly can when you can and just and, and working out the problem really the, the, the and it's great that we have these new enhanced fines because they are necessary it's an important tool in the toolbox for some folks uh, but there are a lot of issues uh, that you may have to confront when you when you start battling blight and vacancy issues in your towns and I encourage you to incorporate sort of that holistic approach if you can. Speaking on behalf of towns that might be hesitant to even implement blight ordinances to begin with, I guess I'm just for those that are talking about this, how do you make the sale? How do you get people to see that this isn't you know big brother that this could that this is needed so i think that that's um, a good question and you know in Torrington, we did have some opposition to starting blight and what we did was is you know that holistic approach and we we developed an ordinance that we you know really was targeted to the worst of the worst type properties. So you need to have at least, you know, um, I think there was, you have to have like three blighted conditions to even be considered blight. You know, there had to be, you know, major uh, criminal activity to be considered blight. That was one of the conditions. Um, so the other thing that we did to that holistic approach is we created a blight committee. So we do have a blight enforcement officer that's out there doing the inspections and doing you know, issuing the notices and following up and working with the property owner. But our blight commission was our building official, our zoning officer, our economic development director, the mayor, the health district, the police department, the fire department, and we met twice a month to talk about that holistic approach and because and that's built right into the ordinance that we created, which gave um, our city council and people who are opposed a little bit more comfort that this wasn't you know, couldn't it be vindictive? It couldn't be one person, you know, picking on somebody they didn't like, or uh, you know, a certain area of town. It was really there was a lot of hands looking at, a lot of eyes looking at this, a lot of hands involved, and you know, it was really the worst of the worst that would have all of these enforcement officers uh, involved anyway. And this was just another tool to make us more successful in compliance with some of the other violations that are on the property. Uh, hi, I'm Lori Witten, Director of Planning and Field, and this is for Jonathan. Um, I'm wondering how much buy-in you had from the Planning and Zoning Commission to do the activities on the streets, the containers and things of that nature, but since zoning really doesn't have any jurisdiction in the right-of-ways. So as far as the, the right-of-way is really just dealing with our um, traffic division and our city engineer. There actually wasn't any precedent for closing the street. So that was one thing I learned quickly. Like, so what is the process? And there wasn't an answer. So um, <laughs> I think what we found in ordinance was that the DPW for us, it's DPF, he has the authority to have emergency closures. And so that just seemed to be the one in that made sense. So as, as long as I got uh, the traffic engineer to understand what we were trying to do, he wasn't exactly bought in, to be honest. Um, but we, you know, I created a detour plan, made sure that the, you know, the GBT or bus service was aware, and you know, we tried to to appease all of their requests. And then we finally got to a place where we said, okay, we, 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 you know, we'll try it. So one thing that I learned from there was, so part of that was since we like as far as lessons learned, we're trying to coalesce all these different bodies and make sure that people. Um, feel like they're being heard, especially the ones that don't have the authority to say no. Um, and so like this year, last year we ended up doing uh, water-filled Jersey barriers and closed off the street for four months. And so like this year, we're looking to instead work through the Board of Police Commissioners and to restrict parking on the weekends and do more temporary barriers. And this way, parking meters don't become a problem either. So that's me showing them you can meet in the middle somewhere. 
Excellent, thank you. Deanna Road, City of Norwich. I want to follow up with my previous question to Rista. Maybe I didn't get the point across. With a distressed community, um, the taxes are really important. So I don't know how, you know, so if it's a developer that has a distressed property and that uh, is blighted and a problematic one, and we have many in our community, but they're paying their taxes. That's always a really hard argument to make, I think, to try to do receivership because now that you know this community is taking this property on and we're going to do things, but now the tax has stopped. Did you I guess my question for you is did you come against up against any of that pushback in Torrington? So Torrington is a little bit unique um, in that we're the only community in the state that has a private tax collector who we receive a hundred percent of our taxes. And they were paying the taxes to the tax collector. If they weren't, our tax collector would have, uh, it would actually been easier because they would have done a, uh, you know, filed a tax lien and then foreclosed on that tax lien. But there was no, no way for them to do that. So in some cases, it's easier when they don't pay taxes because you have that as a tool. Um, but uh, for us, the property is in, is in such bad shape is actually reducing the value of the whole neighborhood. So for us, even though the taxes were paid, we were still able to make that argument that this was worth spending the resources to go in and, and uh, for the receivership because it was actually bringing down our tax base. Does that answer your question? Uh, actually, I uh, actually have two questions, see if we can get them both answered. The first one is to Mike. Um, in in terms of the TIF districts, since that there are only 20, did you say, in the state, it feels like it's highly underutilized. Is there a reason why communities are hesitant to use this lever? I, yeah, I think there is. I think it's a... Uh, Part of it is an education process for both uh, residents as well as municipal officials, kind of understanding how the process works. I mean, I would say 95% of the time, the first reaction is, oh, this TIF, it's like a new tax. And now you're trying to tax me more than what you're taxing before. So you have to get over that hurdle first. And then probably the, uh, you know, the second reason is, you do get some pushback, especially not so much if you're doing like a whole downtown and it's benefiting a lot of properties, but you do get pushback if it's a particular development project as kind of this, you know, a, once again, this corporate give back to some big developer where, you know, a guy down the street that has the house and says, well, I just put an addition on my house. Why didn't I get anything? So I, I think you get both of those. Uh, you know, the argument is, one, not a new tax, two, the idea is that this should benefit the community overall, and, and it should be significant enough to really help the community. So that's what I see. Thank you. And then my second question, I think, is the combination of Peter and Kevin. Uh, we hear a lot when we poll Connecticut Main Street members about, you know, what are the biggest challenges that they're looking to address for their Main Streets and downtowns. Gap financing comes up all the time. But what's interesting, and actually this applies to a lot of what we're hearing today, I think that there are so many tools that we're not necessarily aware of that can actually address some of the things that we keep hearing are a problem. So if the two of you have any comments for our audience members, again, to highlight that there are opportunities to address that problem, uh, so however you want to uh, answer that would be great. Thank you. Well, I, as I mentioned in my comments, I think the, the range of resources that are available from the various state departments are is, is the best that I've seen, just in terms of market responsive programs. Uh, I mean, just with DECD, um, uh, DECD, Community Investment Fund and Communities Challenge, uh, there's funding for both planning and capital projects. Uh, that A program like that hasn't been around. Uh, and and the state has capitalized those programs with very significant resources. 
So if you haven't done so, look at those two programs because you, you get funding for both planning and capital grants. So th that's just that's an example on the DECD side. I mentioned the, the, the example of CHFA uh, for a middle income uh, subordinate loan pro product. That's one of the more creative products that CHFA has come back with. I work all over the country. I didn't used to brag about the range of resources available in Connecticut because it, it, it was, frankly, underwhelming. Um, but um, the, the, uh, the state tax credit has been a huge difference maker because the federal credit in and of itself, um, you know, there are people that say, you know, it, 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 you're not sure if you really net the benefit. But with the state tax credit to be supplemented in the federal tax credit, that has made a huge difference for downtowns. So, um, yeah, I think we just need to create more programs that are responsive to the needs of the marketplace. But Connecticut's been doing that over the last, um, the last 10 years. So. Well, I, I guess I could speak just from the kind of energy and sustainability standpoint and just say that um, the market is, it's like very rapidly changing. There's a lot of federal money coming down. The state has some pretty aggressive policies. So even at the Green Bank, and we work on this all the time, and we're always trying to figure out, what are our programs? Hey, what are the utilities doing? What's going on with the tax credits? So, so it's a lot. So I think we're here to, you know, one of our roles is to try to explain that to people, um, you know, on project by project basis. And we also try to work really closely with the state and other partners, you know, Advanced CT, um, DCD. And we're actually, like, working on projects. They're calling us and saying, hey, these people are doing this project. CPAs could help them. The solar lease, you know, so I think there's a lot of collaboration. We want to you know, keep, keep doing that, keep getting better at how to figure out, you know, as early on in the process, are our programs going to be useful to this building owner or developer? Um, and, you know, how are they going to fit with the other sources um, of capital that they're going after? Thank you. Now we have a round of applause and thank you to our great panelists.